So let me get started, okay? I'm going to let you all know that, again, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. And our guest tonight is Megan Weigel. And Megan is a nurse practitioner from the Jacksonville Beach area. She practices at First Coast Integrative Medicine, where she it's her practice. Um, and, and she does a great job over there from what we've heard from many people. And I'm sure she's doing very well. And we want to thank, before I let Megan speak, I want to thank tonight's supporters. We have Bristol Myers Squibb. We have Sanofi Genzyme, Genentech, Biogen, and EMD Serono. I mean, these companies know the, the, the importance of these programs that we're doing. And they know that we're having great turnouts. And so I want to thank our audience for being here tonight. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Okay. Now, during the course of the program, on the right side of your screen, there's a place for you to type in your questions. All right. And we also have a lot of questions already written out. Okay. That we're going to be doing. Megan's going to be speaking about, well, what is there to talk about tonight? COVID. All right. So she's going to talk about COVID-19 and its effect on people with multiple sclerosis. Brain matters, a little thing about how to socialize, I guess, or or something similar. And I'm going to let Megan talk, and I'm going to shut down my screen. And I'm going to be back in about 10 minutes to ask some questions, all right? And uh, But we're going to get started here, all right, Megan? You ready? Sounds good. Um, and then uh, Bill is going to advance my slides, you guys. So I'll just be saying next slide. Um, we're going to talk today about facts about MS and COVID-19. I'm going to give you a resource for for vaccine development. And then we're gonna discuss ways to take care of your mind, body and spirit during a pandemic. And I, I wanna just reinforce the fact that, um, you know, these resources are applicable to anything. They're applicable to flu season, which is upon us, um, even though we're not talking about it because COVID is more, uh, you know, prevalent right now. Um, they're applicable to, um, you know, periods of increases of other illness. Um, and frankly, they're applicable to just any time. So um, without further ado, we'll move forward. MS in a COVID-19 world. So I, I put up this, um, this little graphic here do this and don't do this with masks. Depending on where you live, there are probably still mask mandates. There are here where I live in Florida. Um, there have been some funny and inappropriate cartoons about wearing masks um, and, and other things <laughs> and uh, body parts sticking out and I'll leave it at that. But uh, what I see when I'm uh, interacting with people and even in public is that people are still wearing masks incorrectly. Um, you know, they're letting their nose hang out. Um, um, or uh, there's too much space in between the nose and the mouth. Um, and, and know also that if you have a really hard time wearing a mask because of a respiratory issue, it might be better for you to just wear a face shield. Um, I don't uh, honestly know the statistics of what protects you better or worse or what the face shield does according to the mask, but the bottom line is that it offers you some protection from others and to others from you. Uh, so whatever that you can wear appropriately with the least uh, harm. Next slide. So one of the things I get asked almost every day is how is COVID-19 affecting uh, people living with MS? What medications make you at greater risk for MS? So I'm gonna review some data with you guys that's been published. Um, first of all, if you look at the bottom of the slide, there's a registry called COVMS uh, or COVIMS, depending on where you live. Um, and this is a website a registry for healthcare providers to register people living with MS who have suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Uh, when I last reported on this, I think it was maybe um, not quite a month ago in Orlando with Stuart, um, there were only reported in this uh, case series in the United States about, uh, I think, close to 300 uh, cases. There are way more cases of people living with MS. This is just um, providers who are sending in information to this registry. So in this registry right now, there are 889 confirmed cases of COVID. Um, people recovering or recovered represent over 85% of cases. About 5.5% of reported cases have resulted in death, and over half of the deaths had comorbidities, with the most common ones being uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Of um, 
the recovered and recovering patients, most had relapsing remitting MS, and of the deaths, most had secondary progressive MS. Um, also of the deaths, most had comorbidities, like I mentioned, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. So um, in general, what we know is that the risk factors for COVID are not MS. They are similar to what we see in the general population. On the top of the slide, there was a reported observational study from an early experience at NYU in the MS Comprehensive Care Center. At NYU, um, they found that most patients with COVID-19 did not require hospitalization despite being on DMTs. And again, the factors associated with critical illness were similar to the general at-risk patient population. And disease-modifying therapy use did not emerge as a predictor of poor COVID-19 outcome. Next slide. So we have some additional data that's been published from other countries uh, related to COVID-19 disease. This was published uh, just last, um, or it, this is actually an online publication due to be published next month in MS and Related Disorders. Um, and this uh, looked at the characteristics of COVID-19 disease in MS patients. Um, the study uh, was limited by a small number of subjects, but it seemed in the study that patients on treatment with interferon beta or glutirimer acetate developed mild COVID-19 symptoms without uh, severe complications, uh, that there's a complex effect on their patients that are taking fingolimod, which is an S1P receptor modulator which uh, also is currently being investigated as a potential treatment for COVID-19 infection. Um, but there are some uh, uh, singular case studies suggesting, suggesting that people on fingolimod may have more severe COVID-19 infection. That's just based on one case though, so we can't really say much about that. Um, also, there's some suggestion that CD19 uh, monoclonal antibodies like ocrelizumab and rituximab may have a protective role against COVID-19. However, there's also data that says that these anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies may increase the susceptibility of MS patients to COVID-19. Um, so the, the data is mixed. Next slide. Um, this is uh, another article about B cell depleting therapies that may affect susceptibility to acute respiratory illness among patients with MS. And this is a study from Iran. They looked at 712 patients. And what they found is that uh, being on B cell depleting antibodies or those anti CD20 antibodies was associated with a 2.6 fold increase in the risk of being in the COVID 19 suspect group. So this data suggests the opposite of a, of a protective effect. Next slide. And then we have in general, the, the next question, um, what do disease modifying therapies do to me? What is my risk because of multiple sclerosis? So again, one data set suggests that there is a slightly increased risk for more severe COVID on people who are on anti-CD20 agents and those who have had me recent methylprednisolone use. But that is just a small one small data set. In general, we know that the risk for developing uh, COVID is similar to the risk of the general population, not because you just have MS. If you do have MS, you're, you're on this talk, right? But if you do have MS, your risk of becoming severely ill or uh, dying from COVID um, is greater theoretically if you have more progressive disease are over 60, have a higher level of disability. Um, and the reason for this is because if those things are the case, you are also more likely to have those other comorbidities. You are also more likely to potentially um, have difficulty with uh, breathing and swallowing, which can affect your ability to clear respiratory secretions. Next slide. In general, we're recommending that people currently taking disease modifying therapies stay on them. There is a really individual risk benefit ratio discussion required if you are going to be starting on a new disease modifying therapy or switching 
to a new disease modifying therapy during uh, this era. Um, we really practice extra vigilance for people who are currently on anti-CD20 therapies like acrolizumab or rituximab. Um, and we also look, look closely at lymphocyte, lymphocyte counts depending on what disease modifying therapy you're taking. Stuart, do you have questions for me thus far? I can't hear you, Stuart. The, the, the problems that we have these days, I'm making sure we got the right buttons pushed, right? It's so, okay. I um, couldn't shut Siri up. <laughs> it's okay. I I, um, I was actually saying, yes, I do have a few questions. I have several questions, but I want to let everybody know that's on here as well, that what Megan was talking about in the first couple of slides with the COVID-19 registry, MS Views and News has that right on our homepage, smack dab in the center of the page. As soon as you open it up, that's like the first thing that you're going to see on there. So you could click on there at any time and follow the the numbers that Megan was just talking about, um, and you know maybe whatever's even more up to date when you when you go to check it out. You know if it's tomorrow morning or whatnot. All right. And another thing, you're Siri. That was funny. But mine, every time I say, "Are you serious?" She says, "How can I help you, Stuart?" <laughs> okay. So first question. Should we should we MSers get the COVID-19 test, especially since the tests are not 100 percent accurate from what this person has heard? Yay or nay on being tested? Yeah, I mean, so you should be tested if you think you should be tested with a PCR test. That's the up the nose um, assault weapon, as I call it. If you have symptoms of COVID-19 or you have been around someone who may have or does have COVID-19. If you think you had COVID-19 and you want to get an antibody test, you can get an antibody test. That's a blood test. Um, keeping in mind that we truly don't know at this point how long people maintain antibody uh, uh, antibody presence to the illness. Um, we think maybe three months, maybe six months. And depending on the disease modifying therapy that you have, it may affect your body's ability to mount an antibody response. So a negative result could be a false negative result. So if it's just for the sake of curiosity, I wouldn't recommend uh, getting an antibody test because you could make anything out of it at this point. Um, but the PCR test to see if you have an active COVID infection um, is important if you have uh, been around someone with suspected or confirmed COVID or if you have symptoms concerning for COVID-19. Thank you for that. In general, what is the data of COVID-19 and pre-existing conditions? Um, so, the most common uh, pre-existing conditions that uh, lead you to being more susceptible to COVID are hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. Um, as far as the data for people living with MS who have those conditions, I don't have it memorized. But you can go to the COVMS website, which is covims.org. You can click on current data and you can see the breakdown of recovered or recovering patients versus dead patients. Literally, I hate to be so morbid about it and what um, what comorbidities they had. The most common ones in MS that resulted in death were hypertension, chronic lung disease, um, cardiovascular disease, and other. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So a person writes, uh, are individuals starting Ocrevus during the pandemic? So the answer is yes. The answer is also, it depends on your other medical comorbidities. The answer is also, it depends on your MS severity. So we take all of those things into account, keeping in mind that a young, healthy person with no other risk factors for, um, for severe COVID-19, um, no other risk factors for increased exposure to COVID-19, such as being a healthcare provider or at this point a teacher or a first responder. Um, their greatest risk for anything is MS. 
Great, thank you. Um, a person writes, I'm a 57 year old black woman living with a mess. I've had, co I had COVID-19 in July. How likely am I to be reinfected? <laughs> Let me know and I'll play that lottery ticket. <laughs> Great. I have no idea. I can't tell you that. Uh, we hope not, but um, some people, there's there's been just a couple of case reports coming from um, uh, Asia that uh, there have been cases of reinfection. Right, and and just so that person also, just so that person knows that it, it's going to affect whether you have a mess or you don't. They just don't have the answers for this. Right. Yeah, it has nothing to do with MS. Yeah. Good point, Stuart. Okay. Um, all right, next one. Um, how do MS immunosuppressants affect susceptibility to COVID-19? So that's a super tricky question. It depends on the mechanism of action of the drug. And actually, some of the mechanism of action, some of the mechanisms of action of our disease modifying therapies are thought to potentially um, decrease the acute uh, respiratory inflammatory response, for example, interferons. Um, are thought to decrease the uh, that acute respiratory syndrome that happens secondary to COVID. Um, there are two parts of the immune system that COVID messes with, and and the first part is just your regular immune response. Um, that needs to mount to fight an infection. But the next thing that COVID does is it causes um, uh, this tremendous uh, increase in inflammatory cytokines, and that's what causes the respiratory syndrome that results in death for most people. And disease-modifying disease therapies can hit at different parts of that immune therapy spectrum. So the interferons actually decrease uh, the cytokines and the proteins that are involved in um, in that acute respiratory response. But then some of our, uh, and it's, it's thought actually that some of our drugs may work that way, and that may be why people um, were not seeing uh, this um, super robust uh, signal for people on disease modifying therapies that, that lower lymphocyte counts and things like that. Um, I can also translate this to the rheumatological literature. They looked at people on immune therapies in general, like tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors, uh, medications for rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, psoriasis, other monoclonal antibodies, and they found the same thing in M as they did in MS, that it's not the medications that are putting people at greater risk, it's the other medical comorbidities that, um, that that changed the way a body responds to an illness. So I hope that was helpful, but um, it really just depends on the drug and the, and the person taking the drug ultimately. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. It's pretty much in re relation to what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. It was not from the big list that you saw, but a, one that we just got online. And then we're gonna switch back to you and then we'll come back to more questions, you know, okay. in about another 10, 10 or 15 minutes. All right, okay. so this next one, this one that's similar, and you might have answered it to a degree, uh, when corticosteroids help severe COVID-19, is that due to its immune suppression action? It seems very sick people have their immune system go nuts. Yeah, so initially there was some data that suggested that giving people corticosteroids actually worsened um, the outcome of COVID. Now there's data that suggests that that's actually should be a part of the treatment. Um, perhaps it's the timing of the corticosteroids given to a person with COVID-19. Um, I don't treat the disease, so I'm, I'm not sure that I am armed to provide you with the best scientific information for that. Um, a person who is chronically treated with corticosteroids um, has a different immune system than a person who gets them when they need them for an acute illness. Um, similarly, as in the, I, I think it was the, uh, there was an Italian data set that said people who, um, in fact, Bill, could you go back one slide, if you don't mind, please? Yeah, it's an Italian da data set that found that recent methylprednisolone use 
uh, was associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. So in my mind, scientifically, it depends on when the steroids are given. If a person is immunosuppressed from steroids, they're more likely to get COVID and not mount the appropriate response. But if a person is given steroids for the acute inflammatory respiratory response, then it can be beneficial for them. Great, thank you. So going forward, uh, yes, you're gonna go back into what you're discussing in a few moments. I just wanna let everybody know that there are a lot of questions that are still pending regarding COVID-19. And there's that many more that are just MS in general related questions. We will be getting to them all during the course of intermittently while Megan is talking. And after she's finished, we will then just go through them one by one very quickly. She's going to do very rapid responses. OK. All right, Megan, it's up to you again. Go for it. OK, you can uh, move forward two slides, Bill, please. <laughs> All right, so the third question of the day is, what about the vaccine for COVID? So I'm gonna tell you guys right now, I am not a vaccine expert, um, but there is currently uh, in the literature coming out in droves, um, what do we need to do to make people with MS vaccine ready? Um, and most of the questions revolve around our anti-CD20 depleting therapies, which the one that's approved in the United States is acrolizumab and actually now ofatumumab. Um, uh, and, uh, and then also rituximab. So initially, we what we know about these drugs is that um, we can't give uh, live vaccines once the drug has been given, but we can appropriately time non-live vaccines uh, to mount an immune response. Um, so this article um, says that uh, B cell subset inhibition uh, would not influence the innate response, which, response which is needed to control uh, the virus elimination. Um, and it's also suggesting that um, uh, vaccine responses are predicted to be blunted with um, these B cell therapies based on when the vaccine is given. So we need to find this sweet spot of dose interruption. For example, if you're on ocrelizumab, you're dosed every six months. Um, so there's a sweet spot of your B cells coming up, giving a vaccination, waiting two weeks, redosing, uh, and, and not waiting too long so that your MS becomes active again. Next slide. So I wanted to um, share this resource with you. This resource is from the New York Times. It's a page. If you Google New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker, you can get up to date information on the vaccines. You can see here that there are 23 in phase one studies, 14 in phase two, nine in phase three, three have limited approval. None have been approved for, for full use. And Bill, if you could click on that link, we'll just bring that up quickly. So also on this page, um, if you can, if you scroll through it, you can read about the types of vaccines that are being developed. The most common one is the mRNA vaccine. Uh, there are also inactivated viruses. There are protein peptides. In Jacksonville uh, at Mayo Clinic, they're enrolling for the phase two slash three arm of um, the uh, of an mRNA vaccine. This is the 30,000 people study that you guys have probably heard about on the news. Um, but I would encourage you, if you're interested in, in vaccine development, to take a look at this, um, this uh, website and just continue to monitor it for updates. It will be updated um, right on a regular basis. We can close it and go to the next slide. Um, and so then I'd just like to share quickly, because I'm going to get into this in greater detail, something that was um, that was published recently that looked at the psychological status of patients with relapsing MS during uh, the COVID-19 outbreak and found that there is an impact on the COVID-19 pandemic on the psychological status of people living with relapsing remitting MS. I'm sure it's for all people living with MS. That was just what this study looked at. Um, and so before I move forward with the slides, I'm actually um, 
Stuart going to stop and ask you for more questions because this is the end of the like really COVID specific uh, um, content. Okay, I'm back. How about that? All right, great. Thank you for um, keying me in on that. Sure. So a person writes, a person writes, I'm looking for tips to replace the engagement and support of an in person of in person classes no longer possible with COVID-19 restrictions. I find I'm way less motivated and less healthy since March, since March of this year. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, there are an incredible number of virtual resources and actually they'll be on one of these slides that will be available to you on the MS Views and News website. Um, for exercise, uh, I'll, I'll give a shameless plug for OMS Yoga, um, also for Yoga Moves MS, for Dr. Gretchen Hawley's program, for MS Workouts, for My MS Gym, uh, so many resources for exercise virtually, and many of these are live or live streamed. So you're actually interacting with people. In our yoga classes, we have great conversation. Uh, we've created a yoga class on Monday night specifically for connection. So it's actually not yoga, it's breathing, meditation, and then space for connection because people were asking for that. Um, there are some support groups that have gone virtual. I would contact uh, your local chapter of, of the MS Society and also the MS Foundation. Um, so it's nationalmssociety.org or msfocus.org to see if they have resources for virtual support groups. Um, on the National MS Society webpage, also on the MS Foundation and the MS Association of America, they have specific COVID-19 pages where there may also be resources for virtual connection. Um, it's pretty easy to, um, you know, set up a, a free Zoom account uh, so you can meet with friends on Zoom. You can add people into FaceTime calls, and I strongly recommend doing that right now. Right, and don't forget the MSU site because we do right. tons of virtual programs, right? You guys, well, yeah, so virtual programs, but you guys are connected to everybody. So, yeah, definitely yeah. look around that so website. For those that don't know, we're doing like uh, three to five programs a month right now in virtual programs and and we're we're already building up all of next year where we'll we will be doing these things ready in our planning until the summer of next year so um there's a lot to show so anyway um the the next question is um a person writes uh, since i just received an okra vis infusion how long do i have to wait until i get the flu vaccine and will my risk of getting covid be greater because of that recent infusion I think yeah, of the, so, of the Ocrevus. so you've heard me talk about that your risk may be greater. Um, your risk may be greater, particularly if you have those health conditions. Um, people using anti-CD20 therapies or therapies where your uh, lymphocyte count or uh, B cells are lowered, I would just recommend practicing stronger precautions uh, regarding social distancing, masking, hand washing, being in groups of people, um, uh, you know, making sure that if you are in, in groups of people that it's outside, well ventilated, that sort of thing. Um, as far as the flu vaccine goes, we typically recommend getting vaccines um, about two to four weeks prior to your next infusion. So if you just got infused with acrolizumab, you're not gonna mount a good enough response to the flu vaccine right now. So you'd have to wait until essentially five months from now to get a flu vaccine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next one writes, I need to have a colonoscopy and possibly repair of whatever. We'll know about the procedure. Would the chances of contracting COVID-19 increase from being in an outpatient clinic? You know, my answer is hopefully not. Um, I personally have had an MRI during the pandemic. I've gotten blood work during the pandemic. I've felt very comfortable. Um, you know, I practice, uh, I carry, um, you know, hand sanitizer with me. I wear a mask. Um, I take my shoes off before I go in the house. Um, you know, so those are, you know, some of the things that you can do. But healthcare facilities, particularly controlled environments, 
um, you know, all healthcare facilities should be safe, but controlled environments are very safe. So procedure scheduling is, is separated longer than it used to be and so on and so forth. So I think you should be fine. And if you have this, this is great hand sanitizer. Yes, sir. Lasts a long time, yes. Okay, <laughs> great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've been to the dentist three times in the last yeah, couple of months. Yeah, I've been to the dentist. I was, I was very concerned about that. Very, very concerned. But my but dentist sprayed, they had me, I walked in the door and they sprayed the bottom of my shoes with Lysol. So my dentist has outside it, or say it's like a, it's an addition to a house and in a chair right outside the door to come in, they've got hand sanitizer there. Yeah. And they actually have a camera in the door. They want to make sure that you're using that hand sanitizer because I tried sneaking in on them the other day and they said, no, 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 you got to turn around and go back and use the hand sanitizer. That's so pretty yeah, funny. everybody, everybody's being pretty um, cautious about everything and they're wiping things down for the most part in, in doctor's offices. And, and, you know, we, we just have to hope that everybody is doing their part in making sure yep. that everybody's going to be safe. Yep. Last question of the, well, there might be a couple on the, on the screen itself. But right now on paper, the last one is for COVID is what is a danger level for white blood and lymphocyte counts? Just because they're low, does that put you in grave danger? Yeah. So what we know um, based on the statistics that I've presented, um, because we can only we can we have to assume that many people that are on medicines like the anti CD20 therapies, S1P receptor modulators and um, dimethyl fumarate, which is Tecfidera. Uh, have low, low lymphocyte counts. Um, and so there's not a signal that tells us that you're uh, at an increased risk because of those drugs. Now, I have not read any data at this point that looks at a breakdown of low lymphocyte count um, or a lymphocyte count below a certain point because of an MS drug and an increased risk for COVID. So I don't have that information for you, but I would say that if your lymphocyte count is low, I would definitely be practicing uh, extra precautions. Okay, and the last one, I think you pretty much answered with everything that you discuss in here. But this is an online question: Is there any is there any data on COVID nineteen and MS? Yeah, go to the COVID MS website. Go to the MS Views page and look at the COVID MS and, website. And yeah, and MS, yeah, exactly. Um, it's right. broken down very clearly. We could spend, you know, I could do a webinar for three hours going through the data. It's okay, pretty self-explanatory. Awesome. awesome. So, all right, you you want to continue doing more and then I'll come back and do more yeah. questions or? Great, yeah, please. okay, you can so forward. I'll, see you in a, I'll see you in a few minutes. Yell out okay. if you want me, I'm right here, okay? <laughs> So the reason I presented this psychological uh, slide right now is because of the next slide. And I want to talk about um, things that have to do with your mind, body and spirit. And so there are so many things that we can't control right now. Um, there are so many things that you can control. And I use this picture, if, if people aren't familiar with it, it's Alice in Wonderland looking behind the curtain. And really what I wanted to step into was um, Alice in Wonderland going down a rabbit hole. And I wanted, I want, just want to suggest to you as we go through this that you avoid going down all of the rabbit holes calling out for your attention right now. Next slide. So you can control what you put into your body. You can control what you put on your body. Most visits have gone to telemedicine. Don't avoid calling your healthcare provi provider because of this change. Uh, be prepared for your telemedicine visits. In my part of the world, we're starting to see live patients more. Um, in my practice, I am seeing a greater number of patients live than virtual now, unless they live out of town for me. Um, and it's nice to be able to see people, uh, frankly, after six months of this um, and, you know, inadequate technology, uh, a physical exam is, is really necessary for many people. Um, 
make sure that when you have a telemedicine visit, with that being said, that you place your device in a place where the provider can see you and, and you have room to move. Make sure you wear clothing so that you can demonstrate moving all extremities and make sure you turn your lights on. <laughs> next, next slide. So that's just a, a plug to uh, get yourself to the doctor if you need to. Don't avoid it because of uh, the pandemic. Don't ignore symptoms because you're afraid a provider might ask you to come to the office. Um, so all of us are practicing, I shouldn't say that, I don't know, but most of us are practicing very safe measures to ensure that, um, that uh, infectious disease control is maintained in the office and you may need to be seen. If you have to get blood work done or an outpatient procedure, like the person who asked about the colonoscopy, you can always go to the website of the facility or call to see what their precautions are um, and make an appointment. And then of course, wear a mask. Next, uh, next slide. So these are things that you can also do to take care of your body. Get outside, get some sunshine daily, um, use cooling equipment. Remember that you have multiple sclerosis and most of you are affected by um, elevation in core body temperature, even if it's just sitting in the sun. So use an umbrella, use cooling, uh, cooling vest or neck wrap, a uh, little fan that blows cool water, make sure you're drinking cool water. If you can take a walk with or without assistance or ride a bike and you can do so safely, right now do that. Um, I've talked to so many people who are literally afraid of leaving their homes, like the confines of their inner home. It's so important that you get outside, get fresh air and get exercise right now. Move your body daily. Um, at the uh, at, at one of these slides coming up uh, gives you some online resources for moving your body. Um, feed your body good food. Um, Gosh, I mean, five months ago, <laughs> we couldn't find it, right? Um, our, our shelves in the grocery stores are starting to be stocked a little bit better. People are shopping less out of fear, so there's less hoarding of food. Uh, but I tell people to stock up on frozen vegetables, um, bone broths uh, that can be bought um, in a box, uh, organic berries. You can freeze those for smoothies. Um, right now, it's kind of berry season, it being summer. Um, and uh, a lot of the grocery stores have, you know, three uh, pints of blueberries for $10. And I buy those, wash them and throw them in the freezer uh, when they're on sale. Um, I like making soup out of bone broths. If you don't have uh, a an issue with using bone broth. I personally don't eat red meat, so I use chicken bone broth, but it's very high in protein and it has great healing properties for the gut. So um, when I make a soup, I, I use bone broth or when I, I make a recipe that calls for, um, for uh, broth, I use bone broth. If you're vegetarian, stock up on vegetable broth. Um, cook with spices uh, like oregano, thyme, sage, ginger, uh, garlic, and basil. All of these spices have antiviral properties. You can even, um, you know, chop up things like fresh basil and fresh oregano, fresh thyme in salads. Um, you don't necessarily have to cook with them. My house puts garlic in everything. I put ginger in all of our smoothies. Um, you know, so we're using a lot of foods uh, to try to keep our bodies healthy and then drink lots of water. Also, hug the people in your house a lot for at least 30 seconds. I recently read an article just regarding mental health and COVID, um, suggesting that a 10 second hug with a person that you know that is safe, uh, even with a mask on, can be extremely beneficial to the psyche. Um, you just wanna make sure you know the, the uh, contacts of the person that you're hugging and, and, and you do it safely. In your bubble, in your house, where you don't have to wear masks, I think that physical touch is so important, so continue to do that. Uh, next slide. Supplements uh, should be taken with caution and never without consulting your healthcare provider, uh, hopefully one who's knowledgeable about herbs and supplements and MS and its therapies. 
Um, evidence that we have for supplements in preventing and treating COVID-19 is mostly theoretical and based on cellular data. So I truly don't encourage people to go out and buy a ton, a ton of supplements. There's better evidence for hand washing and physical distancing and following a healthy diet. Um, goals of supplementation, if you do decide to take them uh, for COVID-19, are to block viral entry, inhibit viral replication, improve innate immunity, and balance immune response, uh, especially when inflammation goes awry. So there are different ones to do different things. And the good news is that vitamin D is a recommended supplement to prevent uh, COVID-19. Um, if COVID symptoms occur, it is recommended that vitamin D be stopped uh, if COVID is confirmed. Um, and the reason for that is because excessive intake of vitamin D can actually potentiate inflammatory immune responses when there's a trigger. So it could potentially damage uh, the lung uh, if it's being affected by that uh, respiratory syndrome in COVID. And then I already talked about food. So things like garlic, citrus, green tea, onions, apples, nuts, bok choy, uh, cilantro, arugula, watercress, all of those foods are excellent sources of um, flavonoids and helping your body stay healthy and helping you eliminate toxins from your body. Um, more good news about supplements, uh, turmeric, zinc, quercetin and melatonin are possibly safe to take depending on your medical history. Again, it's really important to talk to a healthcare provider about that first. Next slide. Here are my resources. Um, I know this slide will be up quickly, but the slides will be available on MS Views and News. These are resources specifically for exercise therapies, um, also for uh, specific diets that are healthy um, and that certainly can uh, help uh, prevent you from getting all the things that come around the block. Next slide. So let's talk about taking care of your mind. And this is where that Alice in Wonderland going into the rabbit hole thing really comes in handy. You have to pay attention to what you're letting into your thoughts, you guys. I, this is probably the third time I've presented exactly this slide and almost six months have gone by in this pandemic and I wouldn't change a thing. I don't care if it's repetition. Have a tolerance for uncertainty because as you noticed when I answer these questions, um, many of the things I said where this is based on, on small data sets or we truly don't know, I, I'm not afraid to say that I don't know. Um, there are so many things vying for our attention right now. Uh, politics, sociology, science, uh, so many different conspiracy theories about the virus itself, about vaccines, um, you know, polarized people um, and I, I there are people who thrive on feeding their anxiety they thrive on living in that soup um, I personally had to make a decision not to and so if you have friends or family who feed that for you and you don't want to live there kindly tell them that you don't have room for those thoughts and you choose to limit contact um, or end the conversation. And, and I gave you a, a, a script. So you basically say, I'm trying hard to stay positive. I trust my sources of information. Thank you for your concern. Let's talk later. I had a girlfriend uh, on a text string today um, uh, just text, I choose joy. And she sent a really funny video to us. It was hilarious. So um, use your time on the news to get information, not panic attacks, and seek out good sources of information uh, rather than looking for controversy. Stuart, I suspect we have some questions. Oh my gosh, do we have questions. <laughs> there's, there's so much anxiety with these questions, it's incredible. First one wants to know, is MS considered a terminal disease? No, um, MS is considered a long-term chronic illness. Um, MS can shorten the lifespan of a person uh, by about seven years, depending on the severity of MS. And that's typically related to um, secondary problems like sepsis from urinary tract infection or pneumonia from aspiration. Thank you. 
Another mm -hmm. person wants to know about what is an EDS score? An EDSS score is a score that looks at eight different scales, mostly related to mobility and balance. There is one um, a somewhat cognitive scale in there, but when you're looking at it, when you read about clinical trials for MS drugs, um, you won't see that. What you'll see is just a marker of mobility that goes from uh, no difficulty with mobility at all to death with the in-between being um, needs to use a device like a walker all the time. Great, thank you. Another person wanted to know if it's needed to be that she stopped her DMD during the pandemic. Um, so that's a question uh, to ask your healthcare provider. It's a very individualized question in general for healthy people. We're not recommending that they stop their disease modifying therapies. Okay, great. Um, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know the answer to a lot of things, but I have to ask you, have you seen the research from the Summit Supercomputer Study? No, but I can Google that. Okay. Um, th that's right. And I guess that person can as well. All right. Back to all this uh, in, in that we have typed out. Why is MS such a long illness? Oh, my gosh. I mean, the easiest answer to that is that um, it's commonly diagnosed in people of a young age. It's not associated with a markedly shortened lifespan. So you, you live with it for a long time. Uh, and the, the final point is that we don't have a cure yet. Okay, next, um, should we get the flu shot now or wait until October? I guess it depends on where you live and what uh, flu statistics are doing in your area. I don't think there's harm in getting it now. October's in 27 days. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Gone um, by so fast. <laughs> say that again? I mean, it, it like wasn't yesterday July. It goes by oh, so no. fast. Oh, no. It, it, the pandemic just started. <laughs> I was just in Columbus, Ohio in March, and I'm going back in October. Yay. Like, I'm one of those I can't wait. I've got to get started again. Um, a person writes, I'm trying to get a support dog. Any recommendations? Mm. Um, I don't have a good resource for that, actually. Do you, Stuart? Yes. So if that person wants to write with me directly, I can. I don't have it in front of me. I do have to look it up. But we do have a uh, company that attends all of our in-person mm -hmm. symposiums each year. And I can give them that information when they write to me directly. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but I know who you're talking about. Okay, cool. Um, in fact, they were at the last symposium and they were there with like three or four young dogs laying all over the floor in the resources room. So, all right. Speaking about resources room, before I get to the next question, and since we have over 100 people online right now, I want them to know we are doing our another, another symposium like we've done every year since MS Views and News first came about, which was 11 years ago. All right. So we're doing our next symposium, though, live, virtually. It's going to be a long event. We have a lot of different speakers, okay, and and um, and information is going to start coming out for that probably next week. All right, next question. Um, person writes, I've had MS since 1971 and been on many different treatments and pills. I'm currently on Tecfidera 120 medication. What is your opinion of Tecfidera? Um, Tecfidera is a great disease modifying therapy for people with relapsing forms of MS. Um, you know, it, it's well tolerated in most people. And my opinion of any disease modifying therapy is that if you're not having relapses, you're not having MRI change, and you're not having disease progression on the drug, then it's a drug that's working for you. Our, our ultimate goal is NIDA, which is no evidence of disease activity for a period of time for people. Great, thank you. All right, mm -hmm. and more on Tecfidera. I was on. I was in a pharmacy yesterday, and just as I was walking by, I heard this guy asking the pharmacist, "Where can I get generic Tecfidera?" And and I said, "Contact Mylan." Right? I mean, go on, go on the website, and you'll see it. Right? But maybe you have an answer for that. I mean, there might be people online that want to know that as well. I don't have an answer for that. 
Okay. I'm not, um, I'm, I will say that in case I get asked, um, unless it's really for an economic reason, I'm not a fan of uh, generic biologics. Correct. Me too, for everything. Okay. What's the best way to work with cognitive issues and vision uh, like optic neuritis? Mm, okay, so with cognitive issues, uh, and this speaks to brain health, which um, I'm sort of touching on aspects of brain health throughout this talk, not sort of, I am, uh, but one of the most important things for brain health, two of the most important things for brain health are maintaining um, cognitive activities. So staying active with things like brain games, puzzles, word games, um, and also learning new things. So maybe you pick up a little bit of a new language or you learn an instrument or uh, you learn how to do a new type of craft uh, like, you know, cross stitch or crocheting or something like that, something that it uses um, hand-eye coordination and also requires some, some cognitive, um, cognitive processes. And then the second thing is social interaction. And I know that we're so limited in that right now, uh, but reaching out to friends to talk, to Zoom, to FaceTime, uh, writing letters, writing emails, um, you know, all of these things are ways to stay in touch with people. Um, so those are ways to, to maintain uh, cognitive uh, health. Great, thank you for that. Now, yeah. I know you still have more to your program, so mm -hmm. why don't we get back? Why don't we let you finish out and then we'll come okay. back to our remaining and then we'll come back to our remaining about 15 questions. OK, okay. And, and for and for whoever's putting them in online. OK, and if you're not doing that yet and you want to ask a question, just type it away and and we'll get to it. OK, and that's it. Let's go back to you, Megan. Thank you. Thanks. Um, OK, Bill, we can go to the next slide. So why do we want to take care of our mind? Well, increased stress equals increased inflammation in the body. And in the case of MS, we do know that increased stress, uh, particularly high levels of stress, um, major stress events, and of course, COVID-19 hasn't been studied, but I'm sure <laughs> many people are experiencing it as a majorly stressful and traumatic event. Um, so that stress can uh, equate to brain lesion to relapse. So limit your news and social media time if those things are causing stress for you. Use social media to find connection and humor, not panic, as I mentioned with the news. Start a new book or create a regular FaceTime with friends and family. Um, next slide. So these are a couple of things that you guys can do for yourself to help with anxiety, or you can have someone do for you. One that I love um, the, the most is a forehead sweep. And I actually do it to myself a lot. If Some people like a light pressure, some people like a firm pressure, uh, but you just run three fingers across your forehead into your temples and give a little press in your temples. Do this about three times. So that's really nice. Um, and then another point is large intestine four. These are acu acupuncture points, but they're, um, we're using acupressure with them. This is the point between the thumb web and the index finger. So it's right about here. This is a great point for um, immune system, uh, cold and flu defense, uh, regulating your lung function, sinus congestion and sore throat. So you can just uh, press on that point with a circular motion for about 30 seconds. Um, and then there's another point called, I love the name of it, it, it's called the spirit gate and it's actually a heart point. And it's just under, um, just on your wrist, um, maybe about two, one, one finger breadth down from your pinky finger on the inside of your wrist. And this is a heart point. So this would, um, you know, stimulate a sense of connection, of emotion, of love. Um, and if you're, you know, feeling anxious or disconnected or lonely, this would be a good point to stimulate. Next slide. 
So moving on to taking care of your spirit or your soul. So we've talked about what you put into and on your body. We've talked about what you let into your head and what you let into your head ultimately affects your spirit and your soul. And you wanna take really good care of that. So we talked about maintaining connections. If you're missing things like uh, maybe church or uh, other support groups, try to find a way to make those virtual. Or uh, maybe you feel comfortable with the way a person in your neighborhood is living and you can connect outside on a driveway. Um, but do try to find a way to meet with people who really feed your soul. And you can probably imagine who those people are. Use social media to find humor. Pray if you pray. Um, and breathe. Are you taking deep, full breaths or do you notice that you're just breathing really shallowly? Next slide. Taking care of your spirit and soul can also be done through mindfulness and meditation. And I'm actually going to do a meditation here with you guys shortly. So mindfulness means being present without overreacting or getting overwhelmed. It means uh, seeing a situation as it occurred. It also means being 100% present. So for me, mindfulness right now means I'm here on this webinar with you guys. I'm not off to the side checking my text messages, looking at my emails and doing things like that. Um, be mindful when talking about COVID-19. So notice when you're um, anxiety arises. Um, if there are things that you're feel fearful about, find the facts to dispel the fear. Be mindful when you're taking preventive measures. So since we're washing our hands probably a lot more frequently than we were, you can actually use that 20 to 40 seconds to you know, say, I'm going to use this time to take some deeper breaths than I'm used to taking, or I'm going to use this time to say a prayer, or say a positive affirmation, or think a good thought. And meditation, well, you can't, you can't suck out your thoughts. You can't stop them from happening, but you can watch them without judgment. Consider a meditation, which we'll do here in a second, during which you create a protective shield around yourself, your family, and your home. So I'm gonna talk you guys through this. Next slide. So this is a guided meditation for protection. I think that you'll find it uh, pretty easy to replicate and remember. So I want everybody to just get comfortable in their chairs right now, wherever they're sitting. Sit in a comfortable position so that you can stay alert with me. We're not going to sleep. We're um, practicing relax, relaxing alertness. And uh, press your feet into the ground, wherever they are, and whether or not uh, you can feel them. Mindfully press your feet into the earth and feel that connection. That connection may come from your feet, it may come from your knee joints, from your hip joints, or from your spine. Slow down your breathing. Take inhales that go all the way through your nose and throat down into your belly. And take, take exhales back out in a different direction. And take a deep breath in again and let that fresh air go to areas where you feel discomfort. and then exhale that discomfort from your body. And then continue to take those deep breaths a little bit more slowly and deeply than you usually do. And now call to mind images of yourself, your family and your friends and hold them in your mind's eye. So just see those people that you love and care about. And now imagine that you're building a shield from the ground up, up and around your loved ones like a house. Let the roof of your shield of your house come to a peak above your head, above your people. 
and imagine that that peak extends to the heavens. So you've got this beautiful, clear, protective shield around people that you love and you care about. You're connected to the heavens. And now imagine that roots grow from that shield, connecting you to the ground, to the center of the earth. And then I offer you the following to say in your mind or even out loud, I am safe and well, I am caring and kind, I am cared for, I am at ease. You are safe and well, you are caring and kind, you are cared for, you are at ease. And you keep that pyramid around your loved ones, protecting them, protecting you from harmful things that you can let into your mind and your body and your heart if you're not careful. And take one more deep breath in. And then as you exhale, open your mouth and sigh. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So that's a little guided meditation vis visualization that you can use anytime you feel like you need protection, like going to the lab, going to get your colonoscopy, going to the grocery store, <laughs> anytime you feel like you need it. Next slide. So um, because one of the most common things that we encounter on the news these days is horrible news, um, I'd like to share with you something that my teacher, Dr. Andrew Weil, said a few months ago. He said, trust the body's healing response. People get better. We don't hear about them. So I'd like to leave you with that. You can um, go to the final slide, Bill. It's just a thank you slide. And we can go ahead and finish out our questions. That's a swamp hibiscus, by the way. That is a beautiful. I'm so flower. proud. <laughs> Are you growing that? Yeah, the, the plant was given to me years ago and it never bloomed because I always dumped the water out of it. And it's a swamp hibiscus. It, I thought it was getting oversaturated, but it actually needs to sit in water. And so now it's like we've had so much rain, Stuart. You know, I'm sure you've gotten the same, uh, you know, yes. things. Yes. Um, yes. Anyway, so it's blooming like crazy. It's awesome. <laughs> that's, yeah, well, that's great. Maybe you can replant them into bigger plants and make more of them. You can make baby yeah. hibiscus. Yeah, that's a great idea. Make baby hibiscus, right? Okay, great. Thank you, that. Thank you for all that you just spoke about. We're going to continue with more messages in a minute. I mean, questions in a minute. But I wanted to say thank you, Megan. You did a great job. I loved <laughs> it. Nice. Right. You know, I, I especially love where you're rubbing the forehead. I mean, you want to go do uh, that, and I. Was, it feels so were, good, doesn't it? You, oh my gosh, you, you were doing it. And I was like purring. I was like, that feels great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so um, I know you spoke about Ocrevus before. Another person has a question. How long after stopping Ocrevus do your B cells return to normal? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer to that is variable. So, um, you know, with Ocrelizumab and the prescribing information, um, it, there's not guidance about checking B cells, but most of us do. Uh, just out of curiosity, we might check them after the infusion and then just before your next one. And really, the drug is meant to suppress B cells long term. So uh, we do see long term suppression of B cells with Ocrevus. And, and imagine that if your infusions are every six months and your B cells aren't repleting, that they could stay uh, de depleted longer. Great. So. Thank you for that. Now, I just want to say, um, again, thank you to all our listeners that are out there. We still have very good numbers on here. We have over 90 still showing. That's excellent. Um, for those that 
want to know how they're going to get these slides of Megan's. Well, we we you know we we're recording this entire program, and then we're going to put it onto our YouTube channel. So if you you know just pay attention to the things that MSUs and News is doing, we do make announcements of when we publish each thing to our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to go on there and watch this again, or at least go back and use it for a resource, you know, of, of what you heard and be able to look at Megan's slides as all of those will show there as well. Okay, great, thank you for that. All right, person writes, I'm having a lot of issues with my cognition, thinking and I can't remember things like addresses that I've known already or forever and or the names of my grandkids, oh my God, maybe signs. All right, this really concerns me. I'm 57 years young. I have stopped driving as well. Any suggestions? Yeah, lots of suggestions. The first one is that there are many things besides MS that can cause issues with cognition. Um, there are other medical conditions that can cause issues like vitamin deficiencies, thyroid issues, uh, sleep apnea, uh, depression and anxiety. So I would recommend um, making sure that you have an appointment to discuss those things with your healthcare provider. I would also recommend a formal neuropsychometric testing uh, because this testing breaks down exactly where your deficits lie and then can provide you with a plan for how to approach those deficits, um, for how to basically adapt your life around those things. Um, setting alarms helps, using post-it notes or notes on a on a handheld device um, helps, but it sounds like you are uh, significantly limited, and so I would make sure to check in with a healthcare provider about it. Great, right, thank you. What about hormone levels? I mean, if somebody's, uh, I mean, this person's 57, so obviously there's been a, a change over the years, and would that yeah. also affect memory? Absolutely. So, um, you know, being perimenopausal or menopausal. Um, can affect uh, cognition, or at least we hope that's the only thing. Um, so hormone levels are definitely worth checking if you're having other symptoms of um, menopause or andropause, which is when testosterone gets low. Great, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, person writes, uh, what do you think of elderberry as an immune booster? Um, so great question. So elderberry is also recommended as something that can prevent COVID. However, like vitamin D and perhaps even more serious than vitamin D, it must be stopped at the onset of COVID symptoms um, or even suspected COVID symptoms because it actually does an even better job at, in, at potentiating those uh, immune responses that can cause that acute respiratory syndrome. So you're what, um, going back to this elderberry and vitamin D, you're not mm -hmm. suggesting that either one could cause somebody to have more sensitivity to getting COVID, correct? No, no. Okay. No, right, it's right. it's the it's the if you get COVID, there's no no data that suggests those increase your sensitivity to COVID. If you get COVID, there's theoretical data like based on uh, you know animal models, um, just uh, chemistry, organic chemistry that suggests it could make things worse. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, so that's, I want to be clear about that. People with MS should continue their vitamin D. If a person with MS gets a fever, they should stop vitamin D until they know they don't have COVID. Okay, you know, thank you. So uh, based on something you were just saying, a person wrote back, neuropsych testing, what? Say that again? Okay, all right, that's great. So <laughs> neuropsychometric testing is a really long test. I say that because I've sat in on many of them during my training. Um, it can take anywhere from four to eight hours and some neuropsychologists actually break up the testing because of fatigue related to MS. Um, and basically what it does it, is it assesses different parts of your cognition. It assesses uh, the way you hear things, see things, do things, comprehend things. Um, and based on your performance, it can tell what parts of your brain are um, 
not working the way they should and what that potentially may be caused by. Because like I said, it might not be MS, it might be pain, it might be medication, it might be depression or anxiety, it might be other medical conditions that are causing the problem. So a neuropsychometric test is something that a neuropsychologist does and it would be a referral that you get from your MS provider. So for those that don't know, um, there have been many people that have asked us if they should see a psychiatrist for this testing. Okay, no, an no. <laughs> so psychiatrists don't do neuropsychological testing. Psychologists do neuropsychometric testing, but they have to be neuropsychologists. So these are people who've dedicated their life to studying memory and cognition and the parts of the brain that do that. They typically have their own practices or large academic centers will, will have them on board, um, but it's usually a, a referral that you get from your MS provider. Great, thank you for that answering that. Um, and that same person would like to know if you can explain what is a biologic? A biologic is a drug that is created from, um, I guess, I, living parts isn't the right word, but like monoclonal, <coughs> excuse me, monoclonal antibodies are biologics. They're created from um, uh, antibodies. So living, you know, uh, antibodies are derived from mice or uh, humans. Um, other animals, um, pigs, uh, things that um, have a more sophisticated makeup than something that's just derived chemically in a lab are biologic therapies. Great. Thank you for that. Before I get into the next question, a lot of people are asking also, uh, what do we have coming up in our next programs? And um, so we, a couple of days ago, we had Rick Harris, a psychologist, speaking coincidentally in, in reference to what you were saying. But on um, September 15th, we're gonna be virtually from Dallas, Texas with Dr. Oh. Okai, Dr. Okai, yes, and, um, and Travis Earhart. And Travis Earhart is a physical therapist, personal trainer. He does yoga. He, he's got his own place called Mindset, which also is, is very in tune with everything to do with wellness. And then on, on, yeah, on September 22nd, I don't even know what month I'm in. On September 22nd, we are going to be virtually from Mooresville, North Carolina. All right. And for that, we have a neurologist from Christiansburg, Virginia, Jill Kramer, who will be speaking for that program, and Jeffrey Siegel, who is an MS exercise uh, specialist. And so he'll be on there and he'll be showing some moves and talking about it. And that's what we're doing in September. And then in October, we're going to be, we are definitely going to Columbus, Ohio to do a hybrid event. It'll be live in person for the 35 to 40 people that we can have it at the site. We already have a list of over 50 that want to be there. So we have to cut it back to 35 somehow. All right. And we'll be doing it virtually. And then on October 17th is our symposium. The list goes on and on and on, but I'm going to stop with that right now because we do have six events in, um, in October. All right, and I just named two of them, but you'll hear about the others later in this month. All right, so let's go back. Um, Next Stuart, question. let me just say that sure. about biologic therapy, I, I misspoke when I uh, called Tecfidera a biologic therapy. Typically, biologic therapies are immunotherapies. Um, so they're using portions of uh, a natural immune system. So Tecfidera is actually not derived from a from an immune system. So I misspoke when I called Tecfidera biologic. Okay, don't say that in front of Dane because he says my mommy doesn't make mistakes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, which foods cause flare-ups or inflammation? Which foods can cause flare-ups or inflammation? So there are no known foods that can cause an MS relapse, but foods that cause inflammation in the body in general are processed foods, sugars, alcohol. Um, uh, people who are sensitive to gluten can have uh, inflammation from gluten. Similarly, if you're sensitive, to, uh, sensitive or allergic, which are different things to foods, those will cause inflammation in your body. But um, processed foods, sugar, 
alcohol, sugar sweetened beverages, those are the most common uh, foods that call, cause inflammation. Okay, thank you. By the way, yeah. I keep looking at this red on my forehead and now I'm looking with the hibiscus and I'm saying, that is way too red. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, um, a person wants to know, can symptoms ever get better? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Symptoms can get better. Symptoms can get better with lifestyle change. Symptoms can get better with medication management. Symptoms can get better with rehabilitation therapies. So absolutely symptoms can get better. Symptoms can also get better if you're on the right disease modifying therapy and your disease isn't progressing. Symptoms can also get better if you do things and not sit back and complain or think about how you have so many symptoms. Well, that's the whole point of all the other things that you have to do. <laughs> right, right. Takes, takes okay. work. Yeah, everything takes work. So next one. And of course, this has to do with a lot of what you just spoke about, but they're interested in brain health. And you did just talk about it all, but can you just wrap it all up and bring it back up again? Yeah, absolutely. So brain health, to keep your brain healthy, whether or not you have MS, um, you need to eat a healthy, nutritious diet. And I didn't talk about specifically, um, I didn't dive deep into that today, but I've got plenty of those on MS Views and News on the YouTube channel. <laughs> um, so eat a healthy diet, move your body, exercise, take care of your other medical conditions in addition to MS if you have them, make sure you get good sleep, stress less, connect with other people, um, and, uh, maintain your cognitive uh, facilities with brain games, puzzles, learning new things. Those are the important tenets of brain health. Great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. As a provider, what goes into your decision when prescribing a patient either Tysabri or Ocrevus or Kesimpta or Mascent or so on and so on? Yeah, so uh, the treatment decision is based on um, your MS. So, you know, the severity of your MS, what you've been on prior to whether and, and you may be treatment naive, but what you've been on tri uh, prior to what you're willing to accept as risk, what you're willing to do as a part of being on a medication like medication monitoring. Um, unfortunately, what your insurance says, there may be some games involved there, uh, the efficacy of the drug, uh, whether or not you have other medical conditions that might make, uh, make, it, make a drug contraindicated or uh, a high risk for you to take. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, you know, in the old days when all we had were injectable therapies, we talked about um, dexterity and whether or not you could give yourself an injection or had a support partner that could give you an injection. I think that's still um, that's still a, a consideration these days. Um, so it's a shared process, right? Like I may say, Mary, you need to be on X drug. And you may say, Megan, there's no way I'm taking that drug. And I can't make you take it. And if you don't believe in it, it's not going to work for you. So That's big decision. <laughs> quite true. Thank you. A uh, person online wants to know, is inosine a good, I don't know if I'm saying it right, inosine a good supplement to take for MS? Inosine? I inosine? I-N-O-S-I-N-E. I-N-O-S-I-N-E. I've never heard of that. I-N-O-S-I-N-E. That's how she spelled it. But I don't know. Um, if I just Google that, it's a nucleoside commonly found in transcription RNA. Uh, I have people take inosine for improving their athletic performance. I, I don't know enough about the supplement to say. Um, it says it's used for MS and Parkinson's disease. I've not read any literature about it. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, if, if you can keep asking me questions and I can look for some articles while you're doing that. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Suppose I have to go on antibiotics for an absence, abscess too. Hey, I just went through that, all right? How do, how do MSDMTs affect antibiotics and the underlying infections 
the antibiotics are being prescribed to treat? Um, so MS disease modifying therapies don't affect the mechanism of antibiotics. Um, depending on the disease modifying therapy that you're taking, you could be at greater risk for infection. So it's important that you um, that you you know take the antibiotics, but that your disease modifying therapy, unless there's a drug interaction, shouldn't affect the efficacy of um, the uh, medication of the antibiotic. Okay, how do I reduce stress? So I just talked about that for an hour and a half. <laughs> I know, and you knew what you were gonna talk about and you left it on the questions. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So so listen to the talk again. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, you you just have to really I'll reiterate, be mindful of what you let into your, your body, your head and your heart. Um, and if you are still having reactions to that, that you can't um, modify with your own practice of uh, breathing or meditation or exercise, then I highly recommend um, seeing a mental health professional. Um, and you can do that now, even virtually. Um, and, uh, you know, make a list of some some goals that you'd like to achieve and and work on those um you know really look deep and see what you can do to improve your level of joy in your life awesome awesome all right is there any medication or a treatment that actually helps improve short-term memory loss um you know it really depends on what short-term memory loss is related to um so in multiple sclerosis we use uh, stimulants like uh, modafinil and armodafinil and uh, amphetamines to try to improve fatigue and sometimes cognition um, in multiple sclerosis medications that we use for alzheimer's dementia have not proven to be beneficial um, Sometimes uh, memory issues can be related to depression or anxiety. They compete for the same highway in the brain. So sometimes medications for those things can help with memory if that's the cause. Okay, thank you. All mm -hmm. right, just a few more questions remain and these are online right now. And uh, is there any way to stop the cytokine storm regardless of what MS drug you're on? It seems like the COVID virus can have more devastating effects when it comes, when it does cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah, so there is this, uh, you know, documented uh, post COVID neurological syndrome, which is really symptoms. There are so many of them. Um, and as a person who doesn't treat patients in the hospital, um, I'm only aware of what I read, which is that they're treating uh, this. Uh, cytokine storm, you know, in acute care settings with steroids and various other things. Um, as far as a person who has COVID who then is experiencing neurological effects, I would make darn well sure it's not your MS acting up because your body just went through a pretty serious event that um, uh, required the use of your immune system. Um, and besides that, I would focus on uh, lifestyle, healthy lifestyle changes, like making sure you're getting enough sleep. That's so important right now, even to, to prevent the risk of COVID, uh, making sure you're getting enough sleep, um, that you're not eating foods that can you know, cause inflammation, you're eating a really healthy diet, like I discussed earlier, um, and that you're managing your stress levels well. Okay, good, thank you. Um, next one, I turned 65 in February, now Medicare and Anthem, you, having, she's on Medicare and Anthem. Can the insurance companies make me switch to a generic medication? Um, they can try. That's my only answer. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they can try, but just because a medication has become generic doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be forced to use the generic. There's so much bargaining that goes on between pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies. So you would recommend that that person speak with his or her doctor and yep. that they fight it? Yep. Right. Okay, great. 
Uh, next one, what if you have a lesion in a spot that makes you want food in general? Do they do that? <laughs> Saying um, this only because it's so important. What is the next step or idea? Uh, not, that you do that you not want food in general. Sorry, that you not want food in general. So a lesion that has affected appetite. I, yeah. I know I'm asking you and you didn't write the question. I'm not really clear on the question. Um, you would need to do things to stimulate your appetite. So I think, yeah, That's I think what she, I think what she's saying is, uh, let me just reread it again because I might have said it wrong. What if you have a lesion in a spot that makes you not want food in general? I did say that. Okay. And then she's saying, saying this only because it's so important. What's the next step or idea? So, um, you know, I would focus on eating small, frequent meals. Uh, I don't know um, what that lesion has caused. It could be decreased appetite. So small, frequent meals would work. It could be a change in taste. Um, so, um, you know, using... Uh, foods that have a lot of uh, sweet, sour, uh, you know, um, salty, I don't advocate for salt, but you know what I mean, using a lot of spices, a lot of flavor in food. Um, and if that's still an issue, you know, you could progress to medication that stimulates appetite, uh, medical marijuana, depending on what state you live in. And then we can move on to feeding tubes. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. I was going to say she just, you know, needs to smoke some marijuana. That's all. <laughs> Get the munchies going there, right? <laughs> all right. Two questions My remain. Running out. <laughs> yeah. Two questions remain, and that's it. It doesn't matter if more coming after that. We're doing these last two questions, and that's it. All right. First okay. one: Is there a correlation between the amount of COVID virus particles you're exposed to and the severity of the symptoms, or is the severity of the disease more related to how it replicates in your body? The so the the answer is no. the The number of particles is related to the likelihood of you contracting COVID. The severity of the COVID is related to your body. So, um, you know, the the milieu of your body. Do you have a healthy body, or do you have a body that has uh, impaired? Um, uh, function to clear virus, and and those are those common comorbidities. So going a step further with that, though, I mean we've we've heard and we see about these very physical fit people that are testing positive. We've heard about um, people that have been fitness trainers, um, mm -hmm. um, personal trainers. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it happened down in South Beach, um, getting the disease very badly and dying in a very yeah. short period of time. Um, yeah. So we we hear I mean, we hear about uh, if you look at so I'm just I'll just say it because I'm surprised it hasn't been asked. So there was this thing that happened early this week about, you know, the CDC messed up there uh, or they gave false information about the number of covid deaths at the six percent thing went around on social media. And basically what happened was someone misread the statistics. So 6% of COVID deaths are only related to COVID. The majority of COVID deaths are related to COVID and other medical comorbidities that put you at higher risk for COVID. So what we're hearing about are cases, like a small number of, of cases of people who only died of COVID, they're still the minority. I don't, I don't know why it happens, but it happens. You know, I don't know why a 30 year old pregnant woman gets breast cancer, um, but it happens. It's, it's the minority, but it also, um, it also raises a, a response from the community to maintain alertness, be careful, um, you know, all of these kind of psychological things happen when when those cases are reported in a sensational manner or in just a manner to honor a person's life. Um, you know, the answer to that, Stu, is I don't know. You know, we'll we'll know when we meet our maker, I guess. Ah, 
Okay, so the last one, thank you for answering that as honestly yeah. as you could. Um, the last one is um, this person heard a lot of the questions relating to medicine were about Ocrevus. And she, in this case, seems, um, she wants to know what the difference between Ocrevus is and Jelenia, their method of action and what different types, you know, why is one more dangerous than another? Um, so we don't, I don't know if she's speaking to COVID. They're totally different medications. Um, and I'm just going to give myself a minute to talk about this because it's getting late. But Jelenia is an S1P receptor modulator that stimulates multiple S1P receptors and it sequesters lymph, uh, lymphocytes and lymph nodes. Whereas um, acrolizumab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody that depletes the body of B cells. So, um, with when you take uh, fingolimod or gelenia, some of your white blood cells aren't circulating, which means they can't get across the blood brain barrier and into the brain to cause demyelination. When you take acrolizumab, you lose B cells. So you lose, um, you lose the ability to make antibody against, um, against uh, the things that, that cause demyelination and you also lose uh, some of the ability to create new lymphocytes that affect the disease. Um, I don't know that one can be more dangerous than the other because they have different side effect profiles and different risk profiles. So I think it just depends on the history of the person who is about to take the drug. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you for everything you've done tonight. You know, I want to again I just, thank our supporters. Can I, I go back our... to that? Inosine thing, just real quick. Sure. Um, yeah, so I found a study. It was a one year study in 16 patients. Um, and uh, in those 16 patients, uh, inosine raised uh, serum uric acid levels. And in some old uh, research, it suggested that low serum uric acid levels are associated with multiple sclerosis. Um, so in this study of just 16 patients, um, inosine raised serum uric acid levels. And um, let's see. Uh, showed um, a decrease in the number of gadolinium enhanced lesions and improved EDSS. This is the only study there is. Um, so I like as far as a modern study goes, there's no, been nothing beyond that. So I don't know that I would recommend uh, this supplement for anything that that it's being touted to do. Um, there was another study a year later that showed there was no additional benefit when it was added on to interferon beta. So. Um, I, I would say that it's probably better to change your diet than to take a supplement. <laughs> great. Okay. So you see everybody, Megan has great cognition. She's got good memory. She was able to go back to that question and, and, um, I, geez, I, I wish I had that. Um, all right. So again, let's thank Megan for being here tonight. A virtual round of applause. Okay, and oh, I hear it. She's, oh my God, it's coming in from everywhere. We want to again thank our sponsors, <laughs> our supporters, Bristol Myers Squibb, Sanofi Genzyme, Genentech Biogen, and EMD Serono. And of course, I want to thank everybody who was online with us tonight. And again, remember, this will be put onto our YouTube channel in about seven to 10 days. Okay, we are running a little bit behind again. Megan, thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for everything. <laughs> Namaste. Thank you, Have a great night, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you. Say hello, Dane. <laughs> I will. <laughs> good All night, right. guys. Good night.